Hello, welcome everyone to The Room Podcast, brought to you by the LFC Transfer Room. We're a man down today. Uh, Rich, Richie's ba- uh, battling a case of tonsillitis, so today we have filling in for him Owen Cummings as a guest. And of course, we have our co-host, uh, Alex Kadic as well. Okay, Alex, go right ahead and take us to the transfer roundup. So this week's transfer roundup, Takumi Minamino has joined AS Monaco on a permanent deal. That has been confirmed today. Taiwo Awaniji has joined Nottingham Forest from Union Berlin on a 17 million deal, with Liverpool having a 10% sell-on clause in that. Forest will now also push to sign Liverpool player Nico Williams in a potential deal worth around 15 to 20 million. Divock Origi is ongoing as medical at Milan and will be announced as a new player in the next few hours. Derry City youngster Trent Kone Doherty will also potentially be joining Liverpool next month, and that is from the Echo. Christopher Nkunku extends his contract with Leipzig until 2026 and now has a £51 million release clause. That's courtesy of Fabrizio Romano. Liverpool are interested in Thibaut Werner, according to Football London. Porto expect an offer from Liverpool to sign midfielder Atavio on a deal worth £44 million, pardon me. His agent was in England talking to Liverpool last week, according to the Mirror and Hernal de Noticias. While Fabrizio Romano and Neil Jones claim there is no truth behind the rumours of Otavio. Naby Keita is set to be given a new contract, and that is courtesy of Neil Jones and James Pearce. Liverpool won't stand in the way of any um, Oxley Chamberlain offers if he wants to leave. He's currently valued at £10 million, and that is courtesy of The Athletic. Usman Dembele has an offer from Liverpool and his agent, and has spoken to the Anfield Club already, courtesy of Sport. Jude Bellingham would be more than interested in a move to Liverpool should the Reds plan to make a move for him next summer. That is from Neil Jones. RB Salzburg midfielder Lukas Susic is viewed as a potential elite prospect by Liverpool and the Reds have a strong relationship with the Red Bull group which could ease negotiations in the future. Again, courtesy of Neil Jones. Liverpool have made an offer for Marco Asensio according to Cope um, in the, the Spanish outlet and that is um with a value of around 35 million euros liverpool held talks with on the entourage of serge Gnabry and hope negotiations will smooth after the sale of sadio mane with him also being involved in that entourage and sadio mane will earn 19 million euros gross a year at Bayern, becoming one of the world's highest paid players in and around 354,000 per week He's now the highest paid African player in the world, and that is Build. So some um, really interesting news there. It's t- certainly heating up now. We're getting into the midst of the window. Um, Owen, welcome to the podcast um, again. And is there any rumours or done deals or potential signings there that particularly catch your interest? Timo Werner stands up massively for me there. Um, it seems crazy that two years on, um, after we were very interested in him, um, at Leipzig, it kind of looked like we kind of turned him down, or maybe he turned us down even. And now our interest is reunited in him um, after, yeah, two years of just, he was terrible at Chelsea and he has been a terrible for Chelsea ever since. Um, I think he scored like very, very few league goals. He scored not a terrible amount um, in all competitions, um, got a few assists as well. And I still think there is potential for him to work in a young clock team uh, because in Chelsea's team, they've had three at the back. A three four three, I believe. So it's it's not particularly suited to how he wants to play um, in sort of the winger positions. They doesn't really suit him. Neither does a striker really. Um, and even Robin Lukaku hasn't been able to really fit in there. So yeah, I think Timo Werner, if Liverpool are interested in him, then that's absolutely huge news. Yeah, it certainly is interesting to see that some interest has possibly reignited. I personally do think there's a player in there in Werner. Um, Perhaps he made the wrong switch years ago, but it comes across like he's a bit of a confidence player and perhaps the right manager and the right system is what's needed to get the best out of him. So we'll see on that one. Rigo, yourself, what's caught your eye? Uh, as far as uh, for me, the, the news coming out that we were possibly interested in Otavio from Porto, uh, kind of double dipping in uh, 2022. Um uh, in addition to Luis Diaz, that one kind of caught me a little bit off guard for the simple fact, just because of his age profile, he's already 26 years old. Uh, also, right, right for the player on the 
right hand side a little smaller so not perhaps well suited for the midfield so just wondering how he'd fit in unless there's a system change there um but his pressing numbers look terrific and his progressive passing look, look outstanding as well his end product goal wise he only scored three goals in in primera liga so that's a little on the low side but his assist numbers were i think second or, or ended up being first after luis diaz so um, that one caught me. That one was a little surprising, but it kind of was shot down already by Fabrizio as well as I believe Neil Jones. Uh, the other bit of news there is, of course, the topic we've kind of ruminated on a couple of times already on the podcast, which is what to do with Nabi Keita. Um, we're hearing now reports, obviously, that they're looking to re-sign him and extend this contract past 2023, uh, which, again, is a little, I, I guess, surprising to me just because of his performance and health during his stay at Liverpool. And in addition to the rumors of perhaps including him in a swap deal for possible midfield targets that we have out there, where, whether it be Nicola Barella or other names, uh, Adrian Rubio from uh, Juventus as well has come up as a possible swap target. So those are probably the ones uh, commenting on. And I just wanted to add to that Timor Werner uh, topic that Owen brought up there and, and you added to as well, Alex. Um, I definitely, um, when, when two years ago when we were kind of looking and it was rumored that he was coming here and Klopp already had a conversation with him, I was all for bringing this guy in. I felt we needed some offensive additions. But in the two years since, having a better look at him, obviously playing in the Premier League and having more of a chance to see him than in the Bundesliga, I see a very one-sided player. Someone, as you, as you mentioned, lack, lacking in confidence and uh, someone who needs probably a big target to kind of play behind off of uh, kind of uh, the way he did at RB Leipzig playing off Paulson. So I'm not sure he fits on the wings and I don't uh, with Nunez's transfer to Liverpool, I don't see a space for him up front either. So I think that one's a uh, uh, dead in the water, especially considering his wages. Yeah, I continue to agree on the way in a bit as well there. Um, I do feel like he's a facilitator. He, he can't handle the pressure of guiding an attack on his own. Um, I think there could be potential to see something better out of him, you know, in a Liverpool front three where the responsibility is sort of spread out across that. Um, and with the Naby Keita and Otavio news, I'm sure we'll jump into that in further depth later on. But the one for me that is, you know, quite honestly annoyed me is the sale of Takumi Minamino. With a World Cup season coming up in the middle, we know how much the uh, tournaments in the middle can can quickly, you know, derail the season or cause many issues and roadblocks. I think it's a sale that just hasn't needed to be done. I think there's people if you want to make money back off the Nunes deal, why not sell Phillips or Chamberlain or I think Minamino this the last season has proven himself as someone who can be relied on constantly in games where we need to rotate. I think that's hard to come by. Obviously, his big goals against the likes of Leicester, a um, few early on against Norwich. He's a big cup game player. And I think with, we're going to go into the next season and we're going to play maybe as many games again. You know, a lot of games. We're, we're in the Champions League again. We'll have things like the Community Shield going on. I don't think it's the right time, especially for a fee that is not, it's not, you know, up to 15 million in value, it's nothing staggering for a player. I just don't think that really computes or makes sense to sell them. I mean, how do you feel about that, Owen? Yeah, I feel the same as Alex, actually. I think it's not even a guaranteed 15 million. It's like 12.5 plus add-ons. Um, so, yeah, even though it kind of feels like it's, it's the, the right amount to kind of let him go at the same time, you kind of feel like you need those players in the squad for League Cup, FA Cup game just to have there um, to play and just to kind of make up the squads. Um, so it's kind of it's annoying because you can't really replace him in the market. Um, I know we brought in Fabio Carvalho and I think he'll be an absolutely fantastic um, player for the future. But yeah, it's disappointing to see Minamino go. But at the same time, uh, I'm not 100% convinced that he wanted to be here. Um, and ultimately, I think he wanted to move on. Ultimately, yeah, he's at 27 years old now, kind of in the peak of his career. And yeah, you can understand why he'd want to go and get first team football. So I don't think you can really um, blame him too much for that. Yeah, definitely uh, I agree on, um, on both your points there. He was a valuable member of the squad and came up clutch in, in, in a lot of situations, especially last season. Uh, 
but uh, to, to the point, uh, as you just made as well, he's 27 years old already. He's a star for Japan. He barely got any run in the Premier League. So I think, you know, first team, uh, first team football is definitely on his mind. And even with some of the comments he made after the fact, you know, uh, happy that he scored the goal, but also knowing that it wouldn't come to anything because he wasn't going to be be named to the starting to the starting squad or even come off the bench for the most part. Uh, so yeah, definitely a loss for us uh, to to go along with you know Divac and uh, and Sadio leaving. So we're we're kind of down tools a little bit. So uh, going forward, um, Alex, who who do you think what might possibly fill in that role? Because he uh, Minamino didn't particularly play as a striker so much, but more off to the side most often. So who do you think possibly foresee filling in that role, especially for the cup seasons? It's hard to really say in a in a window where we've let both Origi and Minamino go. Um, players who have impressed with the op- opportunities they've got. So what be if they are little opportunities? But you've got to assume that he's, they're going to be handed down to the younger players. You know, your Carvalho coming in. Uh, potentially J- Jota or Nunes, one of them, might might suffer coming next season with their minutes. Um, should one impress more than the other. So yeah, Carvalho, Elliot, but... None of them are really out and out forwards, um, so it is quite hard to off the top of your, off the top of your head really, you know, name someone outright who's going to come in and take those minutes. But that spot is certainly there and to be to be worn and to be taken. So I think that's something in pre season. You know, Klopp tries someone in a false nine. You know, Firmino will be back and firing, of course. Uh, but we don't really know what the plans are. We don't really know what to expect coming out of that coming out in, into the next season. So I think that's quite a new feeling i think we've, we've been quite knowing what to expect but with the sales and the potential further sales or players walking next season it looks like we're getting a whole new shuffle of players and of the squad so i think who would take spots like that will get a good idea of that in pre-season and uh as you mentioned there a shuffling of the pack uh with that shuffling Oh, and do you think perhaps a system change, formation change is coming up for 22-23? I do, yeah. I think we'll go to the 4-2-3-1. Um, and the fact that we haven't signed a midfielder uh, kind of proves that to me. The fact that um, we've got John Henderson, who's kind of ageing. Same with Fabinho, same with Thiago. Um, James Milner, of course, and their navigator. Um, I don't think those options are going to be enough to last us a season um, in that 4-3-3. So I think a 4 3 one where you can move Bobby Firmino or Carvalho into that number 10 position. And I'd also like to see Curtis Jones coming off the left-hand side. Uh, we saw it at times last season and with the departure of Minamino and Origi, I think that would be really suitable now and it would allow him um, to cut off that left-hand side onto his right foot as he likes to do. So yeah, it would be absolutely fantastic to see that. And um, I think pre-season would give us a lot of indication of what we'll be to come and um, what Klopp wants to do and all the changes that it will make. Yeah, I, I definitely agree on that, uh, especially with kind of the tools that, that that Klopp has at his disposal now, not so much speed merchants on the wings that you can kind of replicate with Mane and, and Salah with that speed factor, but more midfield, uh, right mid, left mid type players in, in Jones and Elliot who can who can play along the, the sides there. So I definitely foresee a formation change. And and with that, I think it, it's a, it should be exciting for us as fans. And it should also uh, put a little bit of trepidation on to our opponents, because I believe we've become a little bit too predictable in the style and mode in which we attack and a little bit uh, too easy to kind of you know, hang hang back five and just, you know, stay compact on the low block. And it's been difficult for us to kind of break that down as we saw towards the end of the season and needed games that we needed all three points for perhaps against the Spurs where they sat back and and definitely against, you know, in the Champions League final against Real Madrid. They, you know, Carlos and Ancelotti said it was very easy to prepare because they knew what we were coming with. So perhaps now we'll we'll have a little bit more mixing and matching and the ability to be a little bit more unpredictable for our opponents, which hopefully brings us more success. I think with unpredictability too comes unpredictability in this window because we've seen, you know, claims uh, from local journalists being like, that's done, Liverpool done for the for the window. 
But one player who, as of, as of the last week, has, it's come out where it looks possible is Tavio from Porto. Um, all of a sudden, a few claims have come out like that and they've had some substance. People have shut it down, but then people have said, oh no, there has been talks held. Um, Owen, where is your stance both on the rumours? Uh, do you think there's you know any meat on the bone there? And what do you think of Otavio as a player? I would love him personally. I think he would be a great squad player. Even though he's 27, um, I still think he would come in and be a great option to have around the team. Um, he's versatile, can play off the wide um, flanks as well as down the centre. So, yeah, for 34 million, um, our recruitment team with Julian Ward to probably get that down a little bit as well. So I couldn't see any harm in the deal um, until like next time if we're waiting for like a Jude Bellingham or something like that. I think it would work. But yeah, unfortunately, Fabrizio Romano and um, many other reliable journalists have shut it down. So uh, I don't think we can really, really read too much into it. Um, and as well as that, I think Paul Joyce has already said that Liverpool are done for this window and that we won't bring anyone in, even though I can't say I agree with that personally. Um, but at the same time, if that's what's happening, then we kind of have to just go with it, don't we? Yeah, 100%. I don't don't think the squad we have either is one of which we can just say, oh, that's done, it's done, you look complete, it's done. I, I don't think anyone feels that way, which is why there's, I wouldn't say anger, but maybe a, you know some disappointment in the air around Liverpool supporters because a lot of people are hoping for another midfield there or one more attacking player since Mane's gone. But m- maybe it's not the case, but if you know rumours can quickly develop and if, if this is one that has substance, I think... It's one where it depends on the price for me. Uh, 34 million is a bit steep for someone who's 27 and hasn't particularly set the world on light. But when you look at the the, the player at RVO and more depth, his numbers are, are honestly quite insane. Um, he would suit a Klopp team immensely. Rigo, you already mentioned his pressures. Uh, almost 29 pressures per 90 at a 99% percentile. So he's not just pressing for the sake of it. He's pressing well and hard and constant throughout the games and you got to think as well when he's playing for Porto how often do they really have a chance to press a team they're going to be dominate they're going to be dominating the ball so when you look at numbers like that and how they could you know line up with Liverpool it's quite an intriguing four um makes a free tackles game as well over two blocks he wins aerials he, he he's really you know he's there's dog in that player which Klopp obviously looks for in players when you know he's doing his work and he's he's trying to figure out who would fit so I think for me it it depends on the price you're going to get him at because obviously his age is a big factor in that um Rigo thoughts on that yourself yeah uh w- w- what jumped out to me definitely was his passing and his pressing and uh and uh envisioning where he would fit uh probably uh replacing Henderson actually on that right right mid side if anything uh since we haven't been able to procure a, a genuine backup to Fabinho at the sixth spot. Uh, I think Jordan probably is going to uh, evolve more to kind of filling in that role, subbing in or, or taking a game here and there in that position. So what jumped out to me more for Otavio was that his, his his ability to press, I think he was, uh, and, and, and take back possession. I think he was second behind Luis Diaz prior to Luis moving in, in, uh, in the transfer, in the last transfer window. Uh, but for him, I think it's if we're looking at him now, it might be not just in the midfield, but perhaps as a replacement for Salah down the line. From all talks, it doesn't seem as if an extension is going to come to fruition, especially as you mentioned in, in the transfer roundup, the salary that Sadio is going to start earning at at Bayern Munich, which would it's going to dwarf whatever uh, Liverpool is going to offer because that would absolutely wreck the wage structure that this put it they put in place so um i think uh, we kind of need to prepare uh i think either in this window or in january with an incoming to kind of kind of take over that right side one of the targets that we were looking at rafinha reportedly is in agreement with chelsea at this point to tra- uh to move over from leeds so that's one target off off the shelf there um, but definitely an impressive player, but not one that's played outside of Portugal and up until this past season or two hasn't really jumped off the page. And um, the other thing I wanted to add there, I think perhaps Julian Ward uh, might need to take the filter off of his search window there. It's, it's currently set to just, you know, Portugal with all the shopping with the <laughs> that he's kind of done. But um, 
it, it'd be a good move, especially if they could get it below that release clause, which is that $34 million. So anything below that would, wouldn't be that bad a business. Yeah, we're doing a lot of um, assessing on the speculation of, you know, who potentially could come in on the forward line. I think we can agree, you know, the forward line isn't exactly set in stone yet, but we've got good depth there and we've got good options and we don't really know how it could pan out, which is a good thing. Uh, the back with the additions of Ramsey, um, Phillips now looks like he's saying that is, you know, obviously shored up as well, it looks like. But one thing that I think it's the elephant in the room is the situation at the midfield. We're not going in for one this season after the two and many talks, obviously, have, have fell through. He's off to Madrid. Um, you know, links with Bellingham, but it looks like it's going to be next year. Um, it's aging. Owen, what's your judgment on this whole situation going on in the midfield? Is there a player you think we should sign this window? Would you wait next to try and get Bellingham? Should we make any signings at all? What's your judgment on it? My main worry is that Salah will leave next season on a free transfer and then we'll sign then a forward for like 70, 80 million. And then as a result of that, we won't let go and then spend 90 odd million on a Bellingham. Uh, that is my main worry that we'll keep avoiding this issue of a midfielder because reality we should have signed uh one out of replacement last summer but we didn't uh we went for elliot and to be fair elliot looked really good at the start of the season but unfortunately he had that terrible injury that put him out um but yeah i do think we need to sign a midfielder this summer um even if it's like a tielemans who i've said time and time again i think would be a great stop gap he's 25 um years old i believe and it's 25 million being said um, for how much he would cost. So, yeah, I think on the whole, he would be fantastic just to bring in. He's got experience for his national team as well in Belgium. So, yeah, he would be a great option. But there are options out there, though, as well. Um, 30, 40 million pound players that we get told from the club sometimes or um, journalists saying, oh, there's no one out there really that the club want. Well, look, other teams are signing players. And look, I know we have a very specific sort of mould of player that we want. And You've seen it before with Van Dyke that Klopp wanted him, and if we couldn't get him, then he'd wait until we could get him. So it's it's understandable. And at the same time, I do trust Klopp, and whatever Klopp wants is what I want ultimately. Um, but signing a midfielder could be the difference between um, winning the Champions League final like last season or losing the league title on one point. So yeah, I think it is really important that we do do it if we want to do it. Yeah, de de definitely agree there. I, I feel we're at least one, if not two players short at the moment, um, at least from an experience wise and and potential wise, um, especially in the midfield. I feel we're a little light there uh, with an overall player, a box to box type player who can add some of that speed and power to our midfield um, and a nice left footed option either in the line in the starting lineup or off the bench would be great as well. We don't have too many of those. Um, you know, Nicolo Barella would seem like a, an amazing, uh, an amazing guy to bring in. Someone with an, a vast, you know, obvious experience at Inter. Uh, you know, Serie A winning player as well as you know, uh, Euro winning player for Italy. I think he'd be someone who could add a little bit of that gumption, uh, drive, and, and power in the midfield. And all the links to Jude Bellingham and kind of punting it over to twenty twenty three. I kind of feel like, you know, with the reinforcements that Man City has done and is currently on, uh, is currently doing Holland, uh, Calvin Phillips, uh, and, and to come, uh, Mark Cucurella from, from Brighton is they're just adding, adding more, more talent, more driven, younger players who want to succeed and kind of expelling those experienced players who already won with them and are a little bit getting either getting older or, resting on their laurels a bit or complaining. So uh, they're, they're not stopping. They're, they're, they keep pushing and they, and they keep rearming. So I, I don't think LFC can just be happy with what's been done so far in the window, especially considering the departures that we have and especially considering where we ended up last season. You know, uh, we were down uh, quite a number of points, made a terrific run at the end, fell one point short again. But, you know, to be in a position where instead of chasing, we're leading – you kind of need to make that move to kind of cement and and put a, a foot down that you know we're here we're going to compete and this is our league not not your league and i think jude would be a a1 number one to do so english player obvious fan of jordan 
by all rumors and accounts, wants that move to Anfield. So if we're going to pay through the nose next season, why can't we just pay through the nose this season and have two seasons of Jude instead of one, and especially considering if Salah's going to leave on a free, maximize the short window that we have, especially if we don't move Salah, which at this point I'm not opposed to if there's a good target to bring in, of course. Pressure is definitely uh, building on some clarity to this whole midfield situation. I think the Tillman's point was a brilliant one. Um, it's deals running out, I believe. So it's a cheap option uh, considering the player he is. And if Liverpool are this club with a with a model of, you know, flipping players for more money if they're not, you know, complete and utter unbelievable assets, wouldn't that be one that makes sense to them and their model, you know, as, as a cheap midfielder, you know, even if it doesn't work out, you could probably flip them for a bit more, you know, come a season or two. And I think with Liverpool as well, when we think, oh, maybe the right player's not there, so we'll we'll make shift players here and there. When you're looking at like the likes of Jones and Elliot um, Carvalho coming in, that's quite a lot of pressure on people to, one, perform, but perform in positions where they aren't necessarily solid in. So you even looked at Elliot where you, you didn't sign Wine out and Wine out replacement, and all of a sudden he's starting the first few games as a as a three man midfield. That's a lot of pressure on someone who's not you know a box to box central midfielder. So I think that's something where if, if we if we could just you know bring the purse out and just you know sign a option, um, it it would be it'd be a lot of help even with the Bere- the Berea links, um. I'd love, I'd love Beret. I think he's a great ball, ball progressor. He can attack, he can defend. He's he's a great eight of what we're looking for. But Naby Kite is apparently involved in, you know, going there and him coming the other with money involved. So if you do that, you're then not even fixing the option of depth that apparently we have. So it's a, you know, is it quality or is it depth that we're really missing in the midfield at the minute? But let's move on from that. And um get into a room that we talked about last week. Marco Asensio, apparently, you know, that there's been talks there according to some sources. Owen, are you a fan of the player or a potential move there for uh, the Madrid player? I think it was good back in the day, 2016, 2017, he was like one of the up-and-coming youngsters in Europe and he had massive things coming for him at Real Madrid. Um, but yeah, all the hype has kind of died down in recent years and Real Madrid, since losing Ronaldo, um, Bale's kind of declined very badly. Um, so I think they struggled when that all happened. And yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Asensio, if I'm being totally honest. I think he's six, 26 years old. Um, I guess he would be an all right squad player. Um, but at the same time, he'd have heavy wages. Um, I can't see him earning less than 150. And even then, I can't see under the sort of current mould that we got that we the club would want to offer him that sort of money. So I don't know it's very sort of hit and miss um if it's 25 million 30 million around that i guess there's not a whole lot to lose but at the same time um i guess you could get better players out there or even spend a little bit more and then buy a more um not established but sort of promising player for the future who you know you could kind of develop into um something that's going to be the best in the world where i don't see that being the case of asensio i don't see him joining liverpool and becoming um, one of the biggest players in the Premier League or the biggest players in the world. So it's a bit kind of uninspiring, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I, I feel it's a player that we won't really um, uh, get the most out of him. I think I think the way the, the way his past couple of years have gone, it's you play around the down downside a little bit, especially health-wise and, and product-wise. And I believe we have... Uh, already someone in that mold and Elliot that would play in that position uh, on the right hand side. So I think it would it, for the price that they're they're claiming thirty five million on the last year of his contract. That's pretty much Sadio Mane uh, Sadio Mane money. Uh, no thank you, especially on the wages. Um, if we're even trying to to re-sign Salah, save, save some of those high wages for for him as opposed to bringing in an unproven Premier League player and a player who hasn't had much success or, or game time with his current squad. Um. Yeah, for me, I'd stay well well away. Um, minutes have been on the decline for years since he sort of broke through. Um, the season, Madrid obviously won the Champions League um, in Kiev. 
So since then, he's not been playing as much. He's not been getting as many minutes. And obviously, he hasn't been performing much. He's had bad injuries as well, I believe, which obviously has halted us from signing players in the back. Uh, in the past, they got bad injury records. I just don't think he'd fit. I don't think there's the money there to pay him his, his wages. And I, to be honest, I think the room is a fickle. I, I wouldn't. I kind of don't acknowledge that it could possibly happen because I'm praying that it doesn't. Another player who sort of has a similar, you know, recent, you know, path as of late is Dembele, one who's also suffered from his own um, injury problems and form problems. And just before we do um, round off the podcast, um, Dembele, apparently he has had an offer, him and his agent from Liverpool, and they've spoken already, uh, courtesy of Sport, as mentioned in the roundup. Um, Owen, would you be a fan of the prospect of Dembele coming to Anfield? Not at all. He's absolutely been injury prone over these last few years. And even though he came to Barcelona from Borussia Dortmund for over 100 million, I believe, um, he just hasn't lived up to that expectation at all. And deals like Dembele to Barcelona, why Barcelona in the state they are. Um, Coutinho as well hasn't worked out for them. They sold Suarez, sold Neymar. And yeah, ultimately, um, they're in a mess right now and yeah, they just want to get rid of Dembele. They want to offload the problem. So uh, I think probably FIFA players will probably say, oh yeah, I'd take Dembele any day, but no, he, he wouldn't work in this clock team at all. Um, I remember it being mentioned actually a few years ago um, or a couple of years ago when we signed Jota that uh, Dembele was the alternative and Ishmael Asar as well. Um, but yeah, I think in the end, we always look past it and there's, there's better options out there. There's no other way to put it really. Yeah, uh, I mean, he turned it on at, at the end of last season uh, when he kind of rejected a January transfer move and ended up being the lead assist getter in La Liga, uh, which kind of speaks two things about him. Uh, a, there's talent there. Uh, when he wants to bring it, he can bring it. He definitely has the moves. He has the skills, uh, speed, physical attributes to be a star player. But uh, I don't want a player who brings it at the end of his contract as opposed to during the preceding years there. I know he's had a rough time, uh, big expectations on his shoulders, way young to have those huge expectations with that, you know, over a hundred million dollar transfer fee. Uh, once they got all that money from selling Neymar, uh, they kind of went nuts. Right. Uh, but um, yeah, huge expectation on them. Didn't live up to it. Did help them towards the end of this past season. But I think uh, once again, someone who's expecting a lot wage wise, bonus wise and can't really count on him to stay healthy a and b bring it on both sides of the ball not just on the offensive side um and uh before we conclude today's part i kind of want, wanted to ask you guys uh, your thoughts on this you know we've had we've had our share of departures here we've kind of ruminated on the uh who, who who's the most exciting incoming but uh out of the guys who've left uh, you know minamino divak sadio uh which one's the guy that hurts the most Alex, I I think with Mane you could sort of see a potential decline coming. He had he had a good um, turnaround as a, as a centre forward towards the back in the last season, but I don't want to be on the bandwagon that disrespects him. But he he has had spells where he's underperformed a bit, the same as Salah and the same as anyone really in football. But I think it's got to be uh, the cult hero Origi. Um, with him going all the moments. Um, I'm sure his goal as well got voted the best Liverpool goal of, of all time, his second one against Barcelona, the corner. So he's put up incredible moments and memories. And although, you know, Mane is a Liverpool legend without doubt and, you know, definitely a, a better footballer than what Origi is, just them moments of Origi and surely not, you know, that feeling you get every time he comes on and he saves it, saves us from, from something. He's an orthodox, he's an unlikely source. I think that that feeling gives you memories that not many other players can. So I'd say Origi, yeah. Oh, what about you, Owen? Mine's actually a surprise one, actually. Um, potentially Nico Williams leaving. I'm absolutely gutted about that. I think he has a really promising future and watching him play for Wales it's shown he's versatile he can play left wing back right wing back um even in midfield so I think he'll he will go on to be an unbelievable player in the Premier League and 15 to 20 mil it seems quite low at this stage I think a full season in the Premier League um for Nottingham Forest Fulham Crystal Palace a team like that 
and he could be an established player and we could be looking 30 plus million so i think it's kind of in some ways dumb business from the club i think loaning him out could be a lot smarter um but at the same time i can understand how the club want the money now um uh, but in the in the long term is that the really the sensible thing to do um i got it to see um Arigi and Mane leave but i feel like the time's right it's it's been a while now they've been at the club for six seven years so they've both been kind of declined as you say um uh, had their spells uh where they haven't been performing but at the same time yeah they've delivered in huge moments and yeah they will go down in history for the club yeah uh for yeah good good shout there on nico as well um and you're right uh you know that we might be selling him a little bit short this season as opposed to loaning him out getting you know perhaps even to fulham getting you know getting a full season out of him there but uh, i'm not entirely sure when his contract runs out so that might be a factor there as well uh, the, the the shorter his contract is the lower the possible transfer fee might be for him he's 24 25 still quite a while okay okay so yeah Definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, it, might, it might be player driven at this point, especially with the incoming of Calvin Ramsey coming in. He might just want to go. You know, you might see the writing on the wall, or perhaps Klopp kind of already explained to him where he envisions him being, and perhaps that's not at a future at at Liverpool. So that's why we're kind of leading down this road. For me, uh, definitely uh, the one um, I love, Mane. Um, uh, just a terrific player, embodies everything Liverpool. Uh, should want to be and should and should want in their players. Uh, someone who just works hard, does everything for the team, doesn't seek the limelight. You know, you don't hear anything bad about him. Uh, you, it, it, it's the opposite. All you hear is about his good work that he does back home in Senegal. Uh, so he's definitely one that that's going to hurt a lot. Uh, not seeing him out there anymore, and of course Odigi uh, with all his magical moments. Uh, but I feel like him, uh, he. He's one that, uh, with all those magical moments at the same time, a lot of a lot of his time he wasn't even available off the bench. A lot of injuries here and there, so we couldn't really count on him to provide all those magical times when the opportunities came because he wasn't fit for it. So I wish him nothing but the best in AC Milan. I think he can do great things there. He's remarkably talented. I hope he gets back on the Belgium national squad and kills him for them in the World Cup. Um, but for me, definitely Sadio Mane uh, hurts, hurts, and uh, I wish him, I wish him luck. And I know he'll do great things with uh, that boatload of money that Bayern will be paying him. And uh, with that, uh, we conclude another episode of the Room Podcast, uh, brought to you by LFC Transfer Room. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, and rate us five stars on any and all podcast media. And, of course, on our YouTube stream as well. Thank you all and have a great day.